don't get killed in your pajamas. Anybody ever tell you that was a good business principle? Listen up. another sit down with Michael Francis. You know, from the time I can remember, my youngest days, I always had to have money in my pocket. If I didn't have money in my pocket, my whole demeanor would change. I was always very aggressive, very motivated to make money. It was kind of an innate quality with me. And for most of my life, it worked well. I mean, I did fairly well, you know, especially in the mob years and doing okay now. Sometimes it didn't work, you know, when I got too aggressive, ended up going to jail. All my crimes were, you know, money crimes in a way. Uh, but, you know, I always had to have money in my pocket. So if I didn't, man, I couldn't sleep right. I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't function properly. My mother used to tell me, you know, calm down. It's going to be okay. My girlfriends, no. If I didn't have money, I wouldn't go out. You know, I just had to have money in my pocket. So for me, you know, it was a good thing. And, uh, you know, I learned early on, there are about five basic principles. There's a lot of techniques. There's five basic principles that you really need to, to follow in order to be successful in business. And uh, I actually wrote a book about it. I think 2014 It's called, I'll Make You an Offer You Can't Re Refuse. It was a business book. And uh, it's done quite well, actually. It was translated in, I think, 10 different countries. It was actually on the bestseller list in three Asian countries. For some reason, the Asians seem to like, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do. And I've been to Singapore and Malaysia and Japan and China, love the Asian people, and they like what I do. You know, as a matter of fact, I heard that the, um, the biggest movie ever in China was The Godfather. I heard that from very reliable sources out of China. So they like the mob stuff, and I have a pretty big following there. And they really enjoyed the book, and I get a lot of uh, um, comments from them on it. But... Uh, um, you know, in it, I talk a lot about what made me successful in business, the principles that I learned in the mob life, because that were the early years of my life that I was able to carry later on. Obviously, I don't do things exactly like I did back then, but business is business. You know, whether you're doing it illegally or legally, you know, you have principles that you have to follow. And I'll tell you how, um, you know, I really, really got my first lesson. And I think the first principle is this. You got to have a plan. You can't just go into business and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be in a restaurant. Well, really, what's your plan? Well, I'm going to serve good food. Really? Well, we, uh, that's kind of obvious, right? Well, I'm going to have a good location. Really? Okay, we understand that. But there are a lot of other things you got to have in your plan. How many people you're going to hire? What's your lease going to be? You know, what's your payroll taxes going to be? What's your budget? You know, a lot of stuff that you got to go into. I'm not going to go into all of that now, but you got to have a plan and you got to follow the plan. I'll tell you how I learned this. 1971, I had an auto body shop. I had a leasing company. I'd gone into business with a guy by the name of Tony Morano. And he and I were, were doing fairly well. My father had uh, been away for about a year now. I was involved with the Italian American Civil Rights League, but I was trying to hustle and earn a living. And uh, I was even going to college a little bit on the side. I mean, my life was all very complicated back then after my dad went away. Ended up getting in trouble, got involved with the wrong guys on the street. We did some shady car business, ended up getting indicted. And that was before I was one of the wrong guys, right? I get indicted for grand larceny and fraud. I don't remember exactly what the charges were. I was young, but I ended up going to trial four times. I got three hung juries. I was tied up for almost a year in court every single day. Three hung juries. Juries could not reach a verdict. They would always come back in my favor, 7 to 5, 10 to 2, and, but I just couldn't get them to acquit me. Finally, the fourth trial, you know, halfway through, we asked for a dismissal. The judge dismissed the case. He said, I don't think any jury is going to arrive at a verdict. But it held me up for about a year. I was flat broke, paid the attorneys, had an investigator, flat broke. I'm like 22 years old, and uh, I had to stop my life. I know what to do. A guy by the name of Vinnie Vingo. He was a street guy. He was kind of involved with the league, the Italian American Civil Rights League. He really liked me. He said, Mike, I have this flea market swap meet out in uh, Suffolk County, Long Island. And it was being held at a um, uh, one of the private airports there, MacArthur Airport, I believe. It was a big swap meet. It had several hundred vendors. And it was in an airport hangar. 
um, and also in the outside parking lot, several hundred vendors. So he said, what I want you to do is I want you to um, manage the place for me. Saturdays and Sundays, you're going to have to work long hours. You're going to have to work hard, 12, 14 hours a day, but I'll pay you well. And here's your job. You're going to assign the spots to the vendors. They get there early. It's a first come, first serve basis. And you're going to assign their spots and collect their rent for them. They paid the weekend rent. Great. And so it was a full-time job, right? I started to notice something. People were coming to me. Some of the vendors, they would come there early and say, Michael, you know, this spot works great for me. Can I have this spot, you know, next week? I said, well, I can't really do that because, you know, it's first come, first serve. And they say, hey, I'll give you a couple hundred bucks. It's worth it to me. Once it happened, twice it happens, three times. It wouldn't take the money. I said, no, I can't do that. But then I'm saying, wait a second. Let me go talk to Vinny. I said, this could be a good thing on the side. I'm looking to earn, right? So I go talk to Vinny. I said, Vinny, look, I want to be honest with you. These people are coming to me. They're offering me money to give them good spots. You know, I would never do it because that's like stealing from you. But what do you say? You let me do that. You're the boss. You stay away from it. I'll take the money. I'll be very discreet about it. I know how to handle it. And we'll whack it up. I said, we're going to do good. Trust me. He said, that's your plan? And I said, yeah. He said, that's the plan. And I said, and he kept saying, that's the plan. I don't know why. He repeated himself. But for some reason, from that moment on, the plan, the plan, the plan. I knew that I had to have a plan when I went into business. It was a silly thing like that that stuck in my head. I'll tell you what happened later on. A lot of times the vendors would come to me. And we, by the way, we started that. They'd come to me at a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred bucks there. We started doing really well. You know, I had 10, 15, 20 guys that would come to me all the time and I'd give them the spots that they wanted. They'd give me a couple hundred bucks here and there. Then the vendors started to come and talk to me. You know, Michael, if I had a few extra dollars, I could buy more merchandise. I'm doing so well here. Thank you for giving me that spot. I wish I had more money. So now I'm thinking another thing, another part of my plan. Vinny, these guys are looking for money. I got a captive audience. They come to me every week. I know who they are. I got their address. They're not leaving me. They like me. I said, what about uh, this idea? How about we lend them some money? We charge them 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever the market will bear every week. I said, they'll be happy. They can't go to a bank. Most of these guys don't have credit. I said, and we'll make money on the interest. That's your plan? That's my plan. He said, you got it. Before you know it, we're Shylock and half of the place there. I'm doing it. It's not Vinny. Everybody's doing well. I never, I ne nobody ever missed a payment because I had a captive audience. Before you know it, we're making a couple of thousand a week, me and Vinny. He thought it was brilliant. I'm happy. I ran that market for about two years, just Saturday and Sunday, two days a week. I was making more money at that time, you know, as a 22-year-old kid than you can imagine. You know, several thousand a weekend. So, but that's when it drummed into my hand. So number, into my head rather. Number one, you got to have a plan, no matter what it is. Write out the plan. Stick to the plan. Think about it. Get advice, you know. You know, research other companies or other businesses uh, that, that are doing well. See what their plan was. Put it down in paper and force yourself to follow it. Now, obviously, at times, market changes, things happen. You got to make changes, but you're going to mostly stick to your plan. If you got to throw your whole plan out the window, then something was wrong to start. And something was wrong from the beginning. So first, number one technique or number one principle, you got to have a plan. Number two. This may sound crazy, but it's don't get killed in your pajamas. What do I mean by that? Tell you a story. I'm sitting in a social club with my boss and my cop regime at that time. I was straightened out maybe uh, about a year. And we're sitting down, we're having coffee. I'll never forget. And we start reading the paper. And the boss is reading the paper, Tom DeBelli. He's passed on now. And he looks at it and he starts laughing. He says, oh, my God. He says, look, this guy got killed. Another maid guy got killed in his driveway. While he had a bathrobe and slippers on, he went down to get the newspaper, just like Tony Soprano. Remember, he used to go out in his, his bathrobe. But I remember my boss saying, this guy got killed at 11 o'clock. What the hell was he doing in his bathrobe at 11 o'clock? He said, was he a late, a late uh, riser? He said to me, Michael, don't ever wake up late. Guys that wake up late are never successful in this life. And you know what? I never forgot that. Now, I'm an early riser. Doesn't matter what time I go to bed. If I go to bed three in the morning, I'm up at 5 30, 6 o'clock. What do I do in the morning? It's nice and peaceful. Do my emails. I get a lot of stuff during the night because I'm dealing with people in other countries. 
all right, I get a lot of business done. It's quiet time, two hours, three hours, whatever, I, wherever it is. And then I get on my day. But I was always like that. You cannot, I never saw a guy successful that woke up late after 11, 12, 1 o'clock. Forget about it. First of all, you're lethargic. You can't even think straight. Maybe there's an exception if you have a very successful nightclub and you're out all night, you know. But 10 o'clock, that's about it. You get up after 10 o'clock, I think you, you just thought to have issues. Don't get killed in your pajamas. You got to wake up early. Get your juices flowing. Get your mind going in a good way. Sleep at the right time. Me, I, I don't require a lot of sleep. I was never that way. But you must wake up early. Don't get killed in your pajamas. That's principle number two. Number three, cut to the chase. Good mob expression. What does that mean? Don't have a lot of clutter in your life. If you're in an office and you got a desk and you got papers all over the place, you don't work that way. Don't have a lot of clutter in your life. You got to simplify things. You know, mob guys used to make me laugh. I had one guy in particular. Remember Jerry Zimmerman? Okay. He used to say this all the time. He used to say, you know, I don't make money, Michael. I take money. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I believe that the money in somebody else's pocket really belongs to me. I just got to figure out a way to get it. Now, that's not the right thing, and I'm not telling you that. Our job is to make money, not take money. But he says, I simplify it. I just figure out how I can get the money out of his pocket and put it in mine because it rightfully belongs there. A lot of mob guys thought that way. You know, how do we how do we rob this guy quick? You know, how do we bankrupt this company? What, whatever it is, they wanted to get the money in somebody else's pocket and put it in theirs. But cut to the chase. No clutter, no big elaborate scheme. Get it done quickly. And you know what? I believe in that. I try to simplify things as best as I could. I figure out what my plan is and I go for it as simple as possible can. You want a good example of that? One of the most successful businessmen that we know, okay, Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, brilliant guy, multi-billionaire. He simplifies his life and his business in a big way, I'll tell you. Number one, he arrives at his office almost every morning at about 8.30 a.m., no later. 8.30 a.m. He has no clutter. He uh, um, he has no computer on his desk. He doesn't want to get distracted looking at computers. He don't look at emails. That's not his thing. No emails. Um, he rarely attends meetings, doesn't go to meetings. He has one expertise, and that's trading in stocks. And that's what he focuses on. Every once in a while, he'll get advice from somebody that he trusts. You know, he'll run something by him. Good idea but he eliminates all the clutter in his life. He cuts to the chase, and for him, obviously, it's been very successful. That's what you gotta do. Cut to the chase, get rid of the clutter, simplify things in your business. You'll see, you'll go a long way. Number four, you gotta have a crew. Gotta have a crew. People used to say to me all the time, Michael, you're a brilliant businessman. I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a brilliant businessman. Warren Buffett is more brilliant than I am. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, Job was, was a, a, a lot smarter than me. You know, a lot of guys out there are smarter than me in business. They made more money than me. But I did have two talents. One of them was this. I knew how to choose a good business opportunity. Back in the day, people used to come to me all the time, and they still do now. You've got to see all the business propositions I get from a lot of you out there. And I appreciate that. Send them to me. You know, and we'll talk about it. Maybe I'll get involved. Maybe I won't. You know, I try to simplify things. I pretty much have tunnel vision right now on the things that I'm doing. I, but send it to me. You know, I'd love to give you advice. Maybe I'll get involved. Maybe I won't. But I knew how to choose a good deal. Because back in the day, I'd get hit all the time to the point where I had to have a, a set meeting place every Monday night. I had a club out in Long Island. I used to tell people, if you want to propose a business opportunity to me, Come to the club Monday night. We'll sit down. We'll talk. If I like it, you know, I'll make a decision at that point in time whether to go or not. And uh, I used to do that. So I knew how to choose a good deal. Number two, I knew how to hire the right people and motivate them to do the right job. Because there's a lot of things that I don't like to do. I'm not good at it. Other people will do it better than me. So I always believe you do what you do best, you delegate the rest. But in delegating the rest, you got to delegate them to the right people, the qu right qualified people. And then the trick is to motivate them to do the best job in your behalf, on your business. 
okay? So you got to have a good crew around you. doesn't mean you have to have a lot of people. Your crew could be one person, but it's got to be the right person. And it could be 10. And when somebody isn't working right for you, you weed them out. You don't always make the right choice right away, especially if you have a big business. You know, you're always going to have people that, you know, are just not going to do the right job. And you weed them out, but you do the best you can. You got to have a crew. Number five, you got to have a consigliere. Now, what is a consigliere in the mob? He advises the boss on certain mob matters. But you know what his real job is? The consigliere is really a liaison between the men, the soldiers, and the boss. If you got a gripe, you don't go to the boss. You allegedly go to your consigliere and say, hey, consigliere, you tell him what your problem is. The problem with that is that the consigliere is always handpicked by the boss. And if you go to the consigliere with a problem about the boss, it's not going to work out well for you. So, you know what I mean? But that's allegedly what his position is. But obviously, it's really not the way. He advises the boss. The boss will kick things around with him. And it's an important position in that life. In business, very important to have somebody you can run things by. You don't want a yes man. You want somebody that's going to tell you straight out, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea. And he's going to give you the reasons why. He's going to give you advice. Now, you may not take it. You may be smarter than him, but at least he may alert you to something that you didn't think of. Or he may turn you off totally on the deal. Say, look, I did my work on this. It's not a good idea. Don't do it. And then, like I said, if you follow his advice, it's up to you. But you've got to hire somebody qualified as your consigliere to give you information that you can process and allow you to render a decision on whether you want to move forward or not on a certain business opportunity or a certain thing within your business. Very, very important. So you got one, you got to have a plan. Number two, don't get killed in your pajamas. Don't be a late riser. Number three, cut to the chase. No clutter. You don't want that. Simplify things. Get to the point right away. Number four, you got to have a crew. You got to surround yourself with good people. Remember what I talk about with accountability. You got to be accountable to good people and good people have to be accountable to you. Remember, you're only as good as the people you have around you, the crew you have around you. And remember this too, lie down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. It applies in business too. You got the wrong people around you, you're going to have problems. It's not going to work out. Number five, you got to have a consigliere. You got to have somebody you can kick around things with, get advice from. In my old life, my dad was my consigliere about the mob life. I talked to him. Dad, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? He had knowledge. He was in that life a lot longer than me. He was a good student of the life. He gave me a lot of good advice, helped me out during that time. Got to have somebody in business that you can use and throw things at so that you can get good advice back. Now, in my book, I talk about a lot of other things, people. I'm just being, I'm giving you the bare bones. If you want this book, you can go on Amazon and buy it. It's on all the you know social media sites. If you want an autographed copy from me, you go to store.michaelfrancis.com, store.michaelfrancis.com, and uh, I'll autograph a copy for you if that's important to you. I usually don't sell things, but, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a good book, people. I mean, you'll get a lot out of it, I guarantee. I've got nothing but great comments back from it. So that's that. Um, remember this, no magic formula in business. You got to abide by certain rules. There's no magic formula. You got to play by a good playbook. And hopefully I lay it out for you in this book. And really, that's it for today. So be safe, be healthy. God bless.